Oh no, Akane has the chainsaw. What is she going to do? Why cut some bread for Junpei? What did you expect? So Zero Escape is one of those series where after you play one, you think to yourself, man, what a game. And then someone halfway around the world nine years later hears those thoughts and goes, uh, okay. Created by Kotaro Uchikoshi, the man, the myth, the legend, are three games based on the escape room premise, where you're trapped in a room and have to escape. Pretty easy to understand, to be honest. But what if you add morphogenetic fields and shifting and snails? And these escape rooms are led by the character in a gas mask or plague mask or a bunny rabbit. Wait, why are you? It's a series where you'll learn so many physics theories, more than any teacher could ever tell you. Surprise, boyo, I'm both dead and alive! <laughs> All wrapped in multiple timelines, an incredibly unique writing style, and puzzles that will make your top hat spin and turn blue. Have a look. So today I would like to take a look at these three games, the good, the bad, and good, and maybe show you why this is one of my all-time favorite franchises. Now for this, we have to start at the beginning, with nine people, nine doors, nine hours, nine cats, nine ways to say you drown, it's 999. Released on the DS back in the day, the game was a huge success in the West. In Japan, not so much. And this would be a recurring thing for Uchikoshi, with his style of games finding a bigger crowd over here, with fans who are very familiar with that genre like Professor Layton and Phoenix Wright. So 999 stars Junpei, an interesting kind of main character, but oh no, it looks like he's trapped in a room on a ship, and the water it won't stop. How will he get out of this terrifying situation? Okay, so for this video, I did play the Nonary Games version, because way back when I tried this on the DS, I could not get past the scene. I guess because as someone who loves to read, I kinda read fast. Oh goodness, that's too fast. But for the game, that's not fast. But now on the re-release, I can finally speed read to my heart's content. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I mean, you got voice acting if you're you're into that sort of thing, but I'm not, dummy. What the hell is a funyarimpa? What? What? What do you mean? What the hell is a funyarimpa? <laughs> yeah. You mean, you don't know? So Junpei himself is stuck inside a cabin on a ship, not knowing how he got there, and with a strange bracelet on his hand, but no time to think, as water is rapidly pouring in, and the door seems to be locked without a key in sight, and thus starts the escape room puzzle. I'll go more in depth to it later on, but pretty much you have to point and click to find objects to then use on other objects to eventually find the key to escape. During this, Junpei also looks in the mirror and sees himself. Dang, it's Marty McFly. But also remembers how he got there, being drugged by this dude in a mask. Jeez, dude, don't scare me like that. So after a while of wet ankles, he escapes and spies. Uh, no, not other people. So these are the rest of the prisoners on the ship with you. There's Edgeworth, Santa, <laughs> Mountain, Where Are Your Pants, Daddy, The Color Red, and Water Is Wet. Gee, they sure are a colorful bunch. I really like their designs with outfits that most people would actually wear in public. And looking at the designer's other work, the style really emphasizes on their faces being soft, which is a nice contradiction to the horrors that await them on said ship. But this isn't the time for that. As an announcement overhead, Zero being the guy in that mask, telling them how to escape, that they have to find the number nine door. Now it's not that simple because it's time to learn about digital roots. Okay, so this is like the one maths lesson I'm giving you. When you add numbers together, you get bigger numbers. But what happens when you want smaller numbers? Well, the digital root of a group of numbers is the final single digit number you have left. So say you have 987 is 24, then you do 2 plus 4, meaning the digital root of these three numbers is 6. And if you thought that was good, just wait till the end of the game where every single character can suddenly calculate these large numbers in their heads in like 5 seconds. Uchi. Buddy, I'm sorry, mate. In the real world, people ain't that good at maths. So this then leads to the bracelets, where each person's one has a number, meaning in the combinations of three to five people, they can go through a door if their digital root matches the number on the front. And through that, they solve some puzzles, unlocking more of the ship. So eventually, they should be able to find that number nine door. This is a door. Stop it. Get some help. Well, that sounds reasonable and good. I mean, if we work together, I'm sure. <laughs> hey! What the hell do you think you're doing? Stay back. Ah. If you get any closer, I'll cut her open. 
I'm going off ahead now. Well then, goodbye. And so the man goes through by himself. What is happening in there? Open the door, please. I'm begging you. Help me. Please get me out of here. You want me to explode? Uh, so yeah, with these kind of games, things don't go according to plan. And each time the group split themselves up, something new happens. So throughout the game, you have these puzzles where to escape, you must click on everything, and I mean everything, to get items which you can then combine or use on other items in the room to move on, like finding a cable to a computer to power it up. Whoa, mama, look at how old that computer is. I love old tech. Hi, buddy. So then eventually the new items lead to more things, eventually you get the keys to then leave the room. And that's pretty much the sort of gameplay for the other two games as well. But the weirdest thing is that in every puzzle room, is not that the scenes themselves aren't voiced, but when you find a certain item, one character will talk to you voiced about a physics theory that Uchikoshi most likely looked up on Wikipedia. That thing, I, uh, I don't remember the name, uh, where your body turns into some kind of wax? Yeah? The fat in it turns into something kind of like candle wax, right? And... Yes, saponification, but that's not what it was. And it's so hilarious with how out of context it is sometimes. One minute you're panicking trying to find the escape room, the next a character waddles over. Hey, have you heard about the Garfield theory? It's like imagine you're in an office with co-workers chatting about the usual office drivel, till suddenly one of them goes, Hey, Junpei, have you heard about that UFO sighting in Zanzibar in 1956? No, you haven't? Oh my god, how dumb are you? Well, let me tell you about it in detail, okay? This is the symbol of Saturn. It's an astrological symbol. It's just so hilarious with how out of place they feel at some times, especially one near the end which actually made me burst out laughing. The game is going super plot crazy, and they're just like, hey, have you heard about the updog theory? But I don't hate it. In fact, this is exactly what's so charming about the game. The characters just want to teach you physics theories, and you do learn some cool facts. And oh yeah, they do relate to the plot and puzzle room most of the time. Now as to the characters themselves, they are strange. Strange being, they feel more real than most anime games. They seem to be characters characterized more western with barely any of the typical anime stereotypes you see and Junpei himself is often snarky at times questioning others he ain't no blank MC character where games like Ace Attorney the protagonist would think they're snarky thoughts he just tells it straight to the others and it's very refreshing but like all main characters it can sometimes be dumb never you know it's your first time I might Get wet. Yes, for some reason she's talking about going into the elevator below because it's flooded. Yeesh, Junpei, don't assume things. Now there is also something about the game that adds to the charm, and it's the design. From the characters, how they are drawn, to the little movements they do at times, to the sounds you hear when moving about, excluding the door struggle sounds. Seriously, it sounds like a shoddy dentist pulling a teeth off of the rusty wrench. I hate it so much. But the game just has this 2000s charm that looks so clean on the remaster, and I love everything about it. Now, one other thing I must mention, as it's a staple in the franchise, is that there are multiple endings. Oh, not just one. How about a few of them? And in this game, it's very easy to get them all. Just make sure if you see the same color key and lock, that means you might have to replay a puzzle section to get the new story bits. Alrighty, you ungrateful piece of. So, all in all, as someone who finally played it for the first time himself, I really like 999. It's very simple compared to the later games with an easy to understand system it introduces. The characters are all likeable in their own ways and I love the aesthetic so much. Something about that gritty sound design mixed with the PC-98 aesthetic is just really nice to look at. Nice. But that is just the beginning, as due to the cult success of this game, it garnered an eventual sequel. Yes, all 12 inches of it. It's time for Virtue's Last Reward. Oh my god, the rabbit talks! I'm sure you got lost. So after the huge immense success of 999, that broke records worldwide oh it didn't sell well at all. Shame, really. Uh... I guess the developers though realized, hey, wait, it seems like those dudes across the giant Pacific Ocean really liked our game. How about we go all out on the sequel? With 3D graphics! Oh. Oh no. So Very Large Rabbit is the sequel to 999, with a new cast of characters, well, Mostly. Geez, why aren't you cold? Uh, 
Never mind. Where you play as Sigma, the biggest dude around, who well, after a little flashback showing you, you know, his all-American car, playing his all-American tunes, can't you tell they were trying to win over some country when they made this game? And he gets kidnapped by the hazmat man and wakes up in an elevator with a girl named Phi. Shut up! Just back off, Grandpa! So right away the game shocks you with its 3D graphics. And let me say, I don't like it. Especially compared to the first game, which had such a soft 2D art style that juxtaposed amazingly well with the gringy escape rooms. Now here, everything is soft, and not in the good way. To be fair, it's not that bad. They just make some uh, interesting facial animations from time to time. Look, I would prefer the 2D, but I can understand the move to it. It would be easier to make the models do things, like steal, steal your soul. soul. Okay, well, these two are trapped in the elevator and have to escape. And like before, it's the same point and click style. Find items to find more items to find the key to escape. This time, however, the game has a bit more challenge. Oh yes, the puzzles are way harder now. And also, you need to play on a harder difficulty and also find these two codes to enter in a safe, which is randomized so you can't just look them up online, to get these gold files. They tell you things, spoilery things, but you need them for the true ending. I'll say on your first run, don't worry about them too much because you can go back and try them again near the end. Unless you really like pouring drinks. You're damn Sigma, you alcoholic! So on the outside, they see everyone else who is trapped in the facility. You got Superman. Well, I'm not Superman, that's for sure. Fish eyes. Mommy. Deal. Oh. Old man. The sweetest, kindest person ever. And a kid with soda in his head. So okay, this is all sounding really good so far. Everything improved on the original, right? And look, so many timelines. So... So, so many. But this, I feel, adds to the woes on the worst thing about this game. You walk so slow and can't skip or speed up any of this. Literally a quarter of the playtime is doing this. Now I'm not gonna talk. I want you to experience this too. I'm literally mashing all the buttons. You hear that? But no, nothing. You can't skip or fast forward these scenes when you go between areas. And okay, I understand for scenes you haven't seen, you need to experience it for the first time. But really, this slow. Do we really need to see the animations every single time? In 999, one click and the door magically skips the animation. Like, hello there, just get in me already. And because of the many routes, it happens so often. I'll tell you, if you feel like checking your Twitter feed while playing games, this is the one for you. Also, follow me there while you're at it. But that's not all. Since the game has multiple routes, meaning you have these choices which are in the form of AB game, which is a prisoner's dilemma, which is all about ally betray, which is, look, I'll get to it later, but you gotta go through so many routes, and look, it's amazing. I love Kurosu, I mean Steins Gate, which has a similar sort of thing, but because you can't skip things, when you redo the other routes, it's new content, but it's not really. Because on the chart, you effectively are at the same level as before with a new group of people. But the result is still the same. You open the safe, you get the map. Oh wait, two cards. Oh no, you take it because you're the solo person. Just take it, solo. It's why in this footage you can see me absolutely mashing my way through. It's the same result of dialogue. You don't learn anything new, just with different voices. I get that it has to be like that though, since if you pick this route instead first, you don't want to have to skip those important lines before the life of me. I do not know why this game did not include a fast skip option feature, like the similar Steins Gate, where you can force skip through any dialogue you choose there. This is a remaster, and I really remember this being a huge annoyance for me on the Vita. It's just so frustrating when such a good game with an amazing story is forcing you to go through it so agonizingly slow. Look. I read a lot, okay? I mean, I read fast. I can't help it, it's a curse. The books, there's too many. The movement is so slow, help. But anyway, most people should be fine with it. It's just a slight, slight annoyance. I found replaying this game and it is annoying because the ending of this game, which I won't spoil, don't worry, is so amazing with how everything comes together when you get that true ending. But dearie. Me, the time it takes to travel, and the repeating dialogue. Yes, Solo, I heard you the first time, just take a dang card! Now, the really cool thing the game has involves the AB game, which is pretty much you pick ally or betray, and depending on your result and the other person, you get more or less points on your bracelet. And if you have nine, you can leave the place, though the door can only be opened once. So it's really important that everyone votes ally. But, well, you know. Deal. Now the really cool thing is that if you pick one option, you can go back and do the other one. So say like you pick ally and you find out they picked ally too. Well, replaying it, you're like, okay, they picked ally. I'm sure now when I redo it, if I pick betray, I'll get more points. Then when you play it,
I got betrayed? Last time. I mean, this blew my mind. I could not believe a game you actually about? did this sort of thing. Messing with the player's expectations by having the other character pick the different option to what you thought they picked before. But as a little weird nitpick to this I have with the AB game, is that when someone else gets 9 points, the route ends, because no matter how trustworthy they are, they always, and I mean always, leave without you. And every other character just stands there letting them leave. But no, when you get 9 points, Every single other character gains muscles and rugby tackles you to the ground just to say, No, bad Sigma, only we can leave. It actually was amusingly annoying in a way. Let me leave the dang prison, rabbit man. Speaking of vile laughing rabbits... I'm the Dex it kind of felt like to me, in an effort to make this game hit the mass appeal, they made the bunny act like Monokuma from Danganronpa, who was a very sadistic bear, you know, very over the top. And I don't think it worked the same. Monokuma is way more menacing, actually killing people in front of you. But here, all the bunny does is put you to sleep. Literally. Even 999 had a death in the first hour. Here, the bunny, well, at least it's a personality. Don't get it? Well, don't worry. Just listen while Zero the Third explains it all. And finally, yes, like in the game before, they do bring up random physics theories, although a little more restrained. But I can't ignore the one theory the whole game seems to be based on, Schrodinger's cat. Where the cat is both alive and dead in a box until you open it. Meow. That's the way everyone knows that theory because of this game. And that was VLR, a game I thought I loved the most in the franchise when I first played it on the Vita, but now I really prefer 999 so much more for its simple approach. However, if you can ride out that travel time by, I don't know, checking your phone, you will get to experience one of the craziest plot twists in a video game. Now, funnily enough, a game was also being made alongside this to be the end of the trilogy. However, cause it didn't sell well, it's dead. But after so much fan petition and demand by the community in a separate release, Release. Yes, I don't know why it's not bundled together. It's the finale, with everything built up from the two games, with a whole lot of hype and fan expectation leading to the end. It's Zero Time Dilemma. Red! It's gotta be red! Oh no. Oh no! So, Zero Time Dilemma, a game that came out in a timely fashion after VLR. Oh god, why isn't it released yet? Well, shockingly, the games, as beloved as they are, really didn't sell well. Yeah, I guess murder escape rooms with tons of characters never sold well, huh? Uh. Well, regardless, for the longest time, fans didn't know what was going to happen. Because VLR left things on a cliffhanger. Sigma had unsheathed his giant magnum, don't don't worry, I won't spoil. But it teased and set up a lot for the finale. Even on the replay, I got so hyped to play this one again. But it didn't seem like we would ever get it. And so fans set up petitions and requests. They begged someone to help Uchikoshi finish the Zero Escape trilogy. And the monkey's paw curled a finger. The middle one. To give us this. I have no clue. Well, I mean, at least the game came out, which can't be said for a lot of niche franchises. It still was amazing it was able to exist at all, but there were multiple things about it that just made it feel off. And I'm not talking about Eric's face here. So Zebra's Tiny Dinner is an escape game, this time splitting it up with three groups of three, all trapped by the plague doctor named Zero, who constantly talks about snails and how his life just sucks. And some of these people may be a bit familiar, with the other members being there to be the player's standing character. Then you have these three weirdos. But firstly, I must stress, do not play this game first. It's a love letter to the franchise. They kind of expect you to know the other games. And even though they have a dumb character to explain things to, I mean, seriously, Carlos, you do not know what the morphogenetic field theory is? Seriously, are you some kind of idiot? The game just is made more for fans of the franchise. Yes, all nine of them. Ah, you said the number. The shift phenomena. Shift? It's short for space-time human internal fluctuating transfer. Essentially, it's when a human consciousness is sent through time and space. For example, ah, yes. Anyway, the game is sort of more fragmented with these fragments. So instead of going through a route like VLR, you pick a fragment from each group. And after completing it, you will see... Wait, what the blimey heck? Why am I all the way down here? This is because with the bracelet, after 90 minutes, the Plague Doctor knocks them out and wipes the memories of that time. Meaning whichever fragment you pick won't confuse you. You can truly pick any starting point to this game. Well, with that, let's actually meet the groups. Firstly, C-Team with the leader, Carlos, a small fireman who... Yeah, that. Then you have Junpei, who looks like a return from his first heavy metal concert. 
What the hell happened to me? Anakane, the uh, biggest character. Wait, is that the Superman logo? Well, I'm not Superman, that's for sure. With group Q, you have the leader, Q, a boy trapped in a bowl. Poor thing. Then you have Mira pushing the boundaries of how much fan service we get every game, and Eric. Oh, Eric. Damn, brat. Then you finally have Group D, with Diana, the calm one, with Big Sigma and Small Fi. So before I get to the stellar 3D models, you probably noticed that was a lot different from the character designs, and well that's because they were made by a different character designer, who's currently one of my favourite artists out there. Their style is just so much more realistic than the usual anime look, plus I love every single outfit they gave the characters, well, mostly. But they seriously look like they could belong on a fashion runway, and I really want them for myself. Hey, you know what would be cool? Official Zero Escape merchandise! Hey, Spike Chun sub- oh wait, the series didn't so well. My mistake. Anyway, there's something more grittier to the designs, from the pre-release art to even the amazing logo. The art of this game is just so outstanding. So well, the game starts with you voting on which team you want to die. And if a team gets two votes, well, the heads pop off. This then opens the fragment sections. And for the most part, each fragment has some dialogue, then a puzzle room escape. Cause you know, it's a puzzle game alongside horror. But after a puzzle, they add a decision game where the group has to do some crazy choice and it often leads to death. Uh, so much carnage in this game. It can often be quite gory with how the characters die. What happened to this bunny giving me sweepy pills to go to bed bed? I guess because it's the final game, Uchikoshi unleashed the full power of his horror, even aiming for the highest rating in Japan. Yet somehow I didn't make it. Must be because of the goofy models. Now because of the fragmented nature, it was kind of hard to actually care when the characters died, because if they did, you know, in another fragment they would be fine as usual. It's a different feeling to VLR, where once you go down a route, the death stick with you until you pick another choice. Also the puzzles, because yes, let me look it up. Ah yes, it's a puzzle game. Well, I guess they took the feedback on VLR, because they felt way easier than before. Not 999 level easy, because there's still some BS 3D puzzles. Which one do you want me to blast? Also, wait, these are pretty cool. Hey, maybe you could release some merch of them. I would buy the- oh wait, the game didn't sell well, etc, etc. Now while I got you here, sitting snugly, I'ma give you a hint. If you're stuck, check up top left and unlock these. It will save you so much trouble. Well then, to address the elephant in the room. The elephant. No wait, that's wrong, that looks better than the models in the game. So I guess with the monkey paw scenario, even to get this game, they seemingly went with the cheapest company they could find, and animating these amazing character designs into these things. Okay, they don't actually look that bad, it's just the animation. Oh boy, where to begin? I did not know characters could move this stiffly, or unexpressionably. And even with the expressions, it's sometimes horrifying. Look, with a game like Danganronpa Ultra Despair Girls, well you can tell they had trouble going to 3D. At least the important part, the characters move and animate better. And for a game which has characters screaming and trying to kill each other with emotion, it's just kind of hard to feel that empathy when the voice actors and dialogue are giving so much to a scene because you're seeing Big Derpy here. Yeah, I am! <laughs> Drunk on life! I think it has to do with the eyes because in most scenes the characters rarely move their actual pupils. They stay locked in to the next camera perspective. I guess because they were focused on animating other things at the time. Well, a big plus though about the hilarious animation is, well, the deaths actually don't scare you as much as you would think. I mean, I'm still having Clover nightmares from the game before. But there's another downside to this game, and that is because I feel it tried so hard to appeal to that Western market, if you couldn't already tell. Yes, they forego actual text boxes known to visual novels going for a more cinematic approach, like the Walking Dead games, which means you can't actually press the A button to skip through dialogue if you read fast. And, like I said, that is a big problem for me. You have to watch the cutscenes like an action game. However, if you turn skip dialogue on, you can skip only to the next camera perspective. Yes, I don't know how jank this game engine was. I mean, Enemy with fire like this. Night. But as a fast reader, it got frustrating having to wait for this scene to slowly play out. I mean, you do get used to it after a while, or you can be like me and turn the skip button on and skip ahead to the next camera perspective, then read the missed dialogue in the log, because yes, this is actually faster. Like with VLR, this could have been easily fixed, but here it's really that they wanted to appeal to that Western market. And well, bless them, they really did try. And one thing I want to say, I saw a lot of people notice that Uchikoshi actually didn't write two of these groups and their scenarios, which did add to an uneasiness felt by fans. Playing it myself though, I didn't really notice it. In fact, most of the fun times I had was with C Team, which is the one he didn't write. I bet you're eager to see your dearest love as soon as you can. Ah, oh, Carlos! D Team was the one written by him, and it has the most emotion, I would say. Q Team is just there, you know. There. Damn brat. Also, yes, as usual, there are physics explanations like before, and yes, it's still as funny as ever. 
Leucochloridium. Or Spinocordodes teleniae. Have you heard of either of these, Carlos? No. Toxoplasma gondii. Toxoplasma gondii? So then as to ZTD's ending, well I won't spoil, but a certain plot twist happens and yeah, a lot of people didn't like it, myself included. However, replaying it, I just laughed at it so much. It's also amusing for the first half of the game despite the jank. I think because I played this after VLR, it was actually kind of enjoyable, with so many nods and connections to the other two games, making it perfect for fans of the franchise. However, the ending really leaves you with a sour taste in your mouth. My interpretation is that they doubled down on a appealing to the new player market, and kind of forgot about the hardcore fans who helped make the games possible, which is kind of sad in the end. Now before I go, I want to mention some little things about the franchise. Firstly, the voice acting. I love it so much. There's a certain rustic charm to 999 especially. It just felt so much more wholesome with Junpei and Akane, how they would add these extra flares to their lines, like they really did care about these characters. Huh? What the? Oh, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> Despite my looks, I'm the clean... Oh, <laughs> the queen of random knowledge. The music I also have to shout out with being so unique and experimental across all the games, especially VLR which has the best soundtrack if you want a tense atmosphere, because oh boy did the music make me feel trapped in that facility. Which I guess is kind of sad that ZTD, they reused a lot of the music from VLR because I guess it works so well. And yeah, Zero Escape is just one of those games you have to experience for yourself, with the perfect amount of charming storytelling mixed with horrific scenarios and puzzles. 999 is my favourite with its story gameplay balance and appealing art style. VLR second since it lost points due to that travel thing, but the ending, oh man, what a payoff. And well, ZTD, it's a thing. So hopefully with this video, maybe you might find yourself interested in checking them out, especially since you get two games in one, you know. I mean, if you're then really truly invested, then you can buy ZTD afterwards. And well, if you do play them, please, I hope you do the same thing I did. Zero time dilemma. Oh no, Akane, don't chainsaw me. <laughs> Trojan, Ramses, Magnum, Sheik. 